How's the light, folks? Should I turn off the light? Is it too bright? Let me know, folks. Too bright? Medic, God bless you. God bless every one of you. Thank you for being here. Pray in Jesus' name. The regulars show up. We're getting at least 130, 140. I want to outdo David Wood. That's my goal in life. I want to get 900 people. If someone as boring as David can get that, I'll get that. But pray for me in Jesus' name. That will transform me to be more patient, loving. And I, if I keep blocking people, it's just going to be me and Protestant and first and last. What's up, Liza J? What's up, girlfriend? What it is. Right. Anyway, hope the sound is good. I'm now at Child of God's home. The internet connection is way better than my brother's. In Jesus' name, this week I move in. I'm going to try to get some internet in my apartment. Pray God keeps providing. But one thing, do pray pray for me. Here's what I honestly need your prayers for. God, transform me and keep me pure. Purify me by the blood of Jesus to walk in the power of the Spirit and to die to my flesh and not to give in to my fleshly desires. Okay? I need that because we need to be holy. Not just saying we believe in Jesus because to truly believe in Jesus, to trust in Jesus is to love and obey Jesus. So pray for that for yourselves and for me. All right? Good to see you guys. I'm excited. I just want to say again one more time. It's exciting. Get a peel box so I can mail you out. Okay, I will, Liza. I promise you. Liza, I will do that. Pray for our precious sister, Liza. God, transform her and fill her. She loves Jesus, and Jesus loves her. She's a spiritual warrior, by the grace of God, right? And I don't know. I think God, she feels God has called her. I don't want to give out too much information uh, to sing of us. But she's going to make a godly man very happy. So pray for her that God will reveal to her that godly man so that she can come alongside that man and then they serve Jesus together, okay? She has all the qualities of a Proverbs 31 woman. God bless and watch over. And many of you girls here, I don't know if, I don't know how many of you are single, but I see many women here who are warriors for Jesus. You know, you got Hafsa, you got Michaela, right? And you got warriors who are married. Right, Netta's married, so she's off. Guys, Netta's a Proverbs 31 wife, but she's taken. So, sucks being you guys. And then we have Anna Groin. She's another sister who's on fire for Jesus, right? So we got a lot of sisters who are on fire for Jesus, but most of them are married. Isn't it ironic? Isn't it ironic, guys? The good women who love Jesus, most of them are married. And the few women who are amazing women of faith, because they're so few in number, the competition is too great, right? Is, isn't it amazing? I don't know, Jonathan Simon, man, if you're joking or not, that's scary. And amazing, most of the godly women who love Jesus are married already. And there are few women who are not married, who are Proverbs 31 material. But because there's so few, there's so many men after them. So, guys, if you want to win Liza J's heart, you got to be first and foremost in love with Jesus and pray that God will soften her heart to want to get married. And you got to look like Brad Pitt. Otherwise, forget about it. That means I'm disqualified because I don't look like Brad Pitt. I'm, I look more like Jackie Gleason from the Honeymooners. Right? Oh, I'm sorry, Jonathan. I, I didn't know you. Guys, do covenant with Jonathan. Jonathan is married to someone who's not a believer, and it becomes a tribulation and a trial. Ask Jesus to preserve Jonathan, preserve his testimony, to be filled with love towards his wife, and that the Spirit will convict her to fall in love with Jesus because he's now in a dangerous situation. Right? Oh, by the way, I haven't told you. I actually got to see a picture, first last, not his face. The dude is buffed. The guy is muscular. He lost weight. He's got like abs, and I'm starting to hate on him. I'm praying that he gets fat again because I've lost a lot of weight by the grace of God, and I've kept it off. Glory to Jesus for his grace. I lost weight, and I kept it off. And I'm now praying God will now position me where I can lose that 50 pounds. So thank the Lord I haven't gained it, and I pray I don't gain it, and I keep losing. But this dude, within a couple of months, Went from having a belly to, let's say, a six-pack. And I'm starting to hate on him. And I'm hoping by next year he becomes bigger than me and he looks like Jackie Gleason. Christian Karen. 
let me just encourage you, Christian. And, and see, I don't know if you're a brother or sister because it's Christian Karen. I don't know if Karen's your last name or your sister named Karen, who's a Christian. But anyway, Christian Karen. Let me share some with you. You see, didn't I tell you all the good women are taken? Here, Lisa Briel Rod, who loves Jesus, godly woman, she's taken. Why couldn't a single woman say, Sam, you're handsome. I've been praying for a man like you. Marry me. Hey, look, it's the 21st century. Since women want to be equal to men and we're all one in Christ, women, you need to start asking men out on a date. Right? You guys want to be equal, don't you? You guys want to be one, right? You're saying there's neither male nor female? You even want female pastors? All right, let's go all the way then. Women, start asking godly men out. Let's be equal all across the board. God bless my brother, Alan Ruhul. Alan Ruhul has an excellent blog. He writes from a Catholic perspective, and he's one of those Catholics that I consider to be very knowledgeable, charitable. And again, I'm going to get condemned for this. I know. I consider my brother in Jesus. Liza, that's why if you feel God has called you to marriage, it's okay. Tell someone you like. Say, hey, you know what? I'm praying to see whether God's will is maybe you and I get to know each other and see where it leads. If you don't do that, Liza, you're going to give someone mixed signals so they don't know whether they should approach you or not. Come on now. What's wrong? Okay, see? That's what she feels, but you may be wrong. You never know. Guys, if God has called her to singleness, sucks being you guys. That's one less woman on the market. Now, Christian, let me share something with you. Christian, I do not know of a Christian man or woman who doesn't have sinful tendencies they struggle with. Daily, I struggle with fleshly desires. Daily. Some days I'm better by the grace of God of overcoming, and some days I just give in to my shame and I'm daily begging Jesus, please don't give me what I deserve. Please purify me by your blood. Please fill me with your spirit and save me from my flesh to conquer my flesh. As long as you realize, Christian Karen, it's sin and you're not justifying it and you realize that you don't want to do it, God will show you mercy and love. Now, here's a solution, and I pray that I follow my own advice. We need to pray more. We need to... Worship more, meaning sing more songs, and I need to do that. We need to be reading the word more or hearing the word more. We need to fast more, and also we need to fellowship with Christians more often. Keep ourselves more occupied with the things of God, because guess when you sin? When you're idle. When you're alone, no one around you, that's when you have the tendency to sin. So try not to have any idle time. Put on a sermon on YouTube or listen to the Bible being read out loud or pick up your Bible or listen to Christian songs and sing along and praise Jesus and fast and pray. Occupy yourself with Jesus. You'll be more focused on doing the things of God, less time, idle, and focusing on your flesh. And I pray that I follow that advice. Thank you, Alex. Keep doing it. Christian, you don't have a God who is a cruel dictator taskmaster that will condemn you to hell because of moral failings that you realize are moral failures that you don't want to do and you don't justify doing it and you hate it. He's a loving father who has compassion and Jesus is your brother who has mercy and compassion. If you realize it's sin, if you realize you don't want to do it and you hate doing it, he will show you compassion. You know when it angers the Lord? When you justify that sin, excuse it, no longer call it sin in order to engage in it. I'll give you an example of what I mean. You have people listening to me right now. And they know who they are. And I pray this is from the Spirit. Maybe the Spirit wants me to talk about this to convict them. You have people right now, as I'm talking to, who are engaged in premarital sexual relations. Christian men, Christian women who are having sex with their boyfriends if they're women or girlfriends if they're men, and they know it's sin, but they still justify it saying, well, it's okay because I'm not sleeping around. I'm just with this person, and we intend to get married, and we're Christians. 
That's who Jesus gets angry with. Are you with me there? That's who Jesus gets angry with. Okay, you understand? Because although having desires and attraction to the opposite sex is something, quote unquote, natural. Let me explain what I mean. It is natural for a man to desire a woman because God has designed men to desire women and women to desire men. But those desires have to be purified, sanctified by the Spirit, so that you desire one woman to marry and enjoy her and vice versa. It is not natural to desire someone of the same sex. That's unnatural. That's tainted. That's perverted. However, when you have that natural desire for the opposite sex and you act upon it and sleep with someone before marriage, that is still sexual immorality, just like a man sleeping with a man or a woman sleeping with a woman. All of that is sexual immorality. However, if you have a desire for a woman and you seek marriage with her, and she's the one the Lord has, and you come together in marriage, then intimacy is a gift from God, blessed by God, approved by God in that context. You with me there? So someone knows this was for them. I don't know who you are. The Holy Spirit knows who you are. And I believe this came from the Spirit. And may God save me from my hypocrisy, not to be a hypocrite, but to live this in Jesus' name. Right? Okay? Just remember that. You know who you are. Nothing happens by chance. It's the Spirit who leads and guides the men of God to speak to those issues that the Spirit wants that person to speak. And you know what my prayer is every session. Holy Spirit, you take over. Save me from my own fl flesh. Crucify my flesh. Save me from sinning and grieving your heart, Holy Spirit. Anoint my words to be from you, to bless your people for the glory of Jesus in Jesus' name. Right? Hope that I hope. And by the way, I'm going to give you a true story, an experience I had. How God will open the mouth of his servant. Okay. To speak about an issue. That someone in the audience is struggling with and the Holy Spirit wants to get that person's attention. God does this so many times. That's one of the proofs of his existence that he's so real that things happen that you know are miraculous. Can I give you one true story? I won't mention the sister's name. She knows who she is. She's now a follower of Jesus, right? A follower of Jesus. And she's married to someone and they have three beautiful children and she's given her life to Christ. I don't want to mention her name because I don't have permission, but she knows who she is. I used to teach a local Bible study in the Chicagoland area twice a week, Thursdays and Sundays. Now, this young lady, this young lady, this was only the second time I was meeting her. The first time I met her wasn't in church, and I was listening, witnessing to her at that time. You know, not overtly, but hey, come to Bible study. So that Sunday she shows up. Okay, I don't want to give out too many details because she's married now and she loves Jesus. Guys, the Lord is listening if I'm lying. He is listening and she can confirm. If she gives me permission, maybe one day if I see her, I'll have her share a testimony live. Okay, true story. Okay. I'm sitting there. I'm, I'm not sitting. I'm standing. I'm preaching. She's about four or five rows you know, <clears throat> down. She's sitting in the, in the pew, four or five rows away from me. And I don't know how it happened. I don't even know what I was preaching that day. I forgot. But I remember saying, yes, like some of you. Exactly. I looked in a direction. Guys, listen to this. True story. Some of you think that God doesn't see you. This was the gist of it. And you think you're getting away with your sin. For example, some of you told your mom, when told your mom last night. Now, remember, this is Sunday. Told your mom last night, you're going to your best friend Susie's house. When in reality, you were in the nightclub gyrating your hips till the morning, and that person sunk in the chair, went like this. Okay? Now, I don't know why she did that, and I got kind of troubled because, as you can see, I probably have ADD. I get easily discombobulated, and I lose focus. So when she did that, I didn't know why. A couple of days later, they told me, remember, I don't know nothing about this woman. It's the second time meeting her. You know why she, she sunk in the chair? She knew the Holy Spirit showed up and was exposing what she did. 
because she had told her mother the night before she was going to her best friend Susie's house and her and Susie were in the nightclub till the morning. Now, how did I guess that? How did that come out of my mouth? You understand? I'm not lying to you. I'm not making it up. She's even one of my Facebook friends. I still know her till this day. Okay? Notice what came out of my mouth. Like some of you told your mother, you're going to your best friend Susie's house. I didn't say father or Suzanne. Told your mother, you're going to your best friend Susie's house when you're in the nightclub. And that's exactly what she did. She told her mom, her best friend's name was Susie, and I got to meet her friend. I got to meet her friend. Name was Susie, best friend. Told her mom she's going to go sleep at Susie's house when they went to the nightclub. How did I know that? I didn't know that. But who knew? Who knew? The Holy Spirit. Who revealed that? The Holy Spirit. Why? To get her attention. Hey, you, wake up. I'm more real than you can imagine. God is real, and the God of the Bible is real, and you're going to have to answer to him. Wake up. This is not make-believe. This is not no fairy tale. And that's one of many stories I can tell you, right? So this is why sometimes my conversation will change because what's my prayer? I'm asking the spirit to guide the conversation and control the conversation because if it's from him, we'll be blessed. If it's from me, we won't be blessed. And that's just one of many, okay? One of many, okay? I'm going to share another story with a young man. He's now, now here's what's ironic. This young man is now sold out for Jesus and he's going on the mission field. And both of these people are Assyrian, by the way. This young man, I knew him from the, the hood. He used to be in, you know, he used to drink and go to nightclubs and all that stuff. He came to my Bible study, okay? Another incident. And I just started speaking. And I'm looking at him again. And I'm not, I'm not focusing on it, but I'm looking at him. Before the session was over, he got up and left through the back. That bothered me too. I'm like, why did he leave? Was he bored? He came the week after. You know what he told me? He goes, I got to sit with you. He goes, I just wanted to tell you what God did and how real God is. I go, what is it? He goes, before I came to your Bible class, I was praying about certain problems in my life. No one knew. I go, what is it? He goes, before I came to your Bible class, I was praying about certain problems in my life. No one knew. No for the Lord. I got so afraid because I knew it was Jesus speaking to me, not you, because there was no way you knew what my problems were. And from the fear, I couldn't stick around. I left. Okay. You with me there? He got so overwhelmed and afraid because the presence of God was so real. He knew God showed up and was addressing and if you ask me what it was, I don't know because I don't remember what I said. Honestly, I have no idea what I said and how it was related to him. But he got so overwhelmed of the reality of God, how God, how real God is. He knew, and he said, he goes, I knew it wasn't you. He goes, I knew you weren't speaking anymore because there was no way you knew what I was praying for. There could be no way you could know. And you mentioned everything that I was bringing to prayer to God. How's that possible? Right? Thank you, Lopez. Amen. How's that possible? Okay. Why do I mention it? This is how God speaks. God is real. God is alive. And he will speak through the mouths of servants. He will speak <clears throat> through circumstances. He'll even speak in dreams and visions. He does that till this day and will continue to do it until the Lord returns. He does. He speaks, right? And he may be speaking through, and you don't know he's speaking through to someone. This is why I trust right now, honestly. I trust someone needed to hear what I just said about premarital sex. I wasn't planning on speaking about it. It just happened. Someone needed to hear it. You know who you are, and God knows who you are. I don't need to know who you are. That is a sin between you and the Lord. All I can say, if I'm right, the Spirit wants me to mention it. That means he wants to get someone's attention. You know who you are. And you know what the Lord is telling you? Stop justifying having sex with your partner before marriage. 
I will not honor it. I am not in it. And ex expect discipline if you don't repent. That doesn't mean he hates you. It's because he loves you. He wants you to do things right so he can bless it. And may God save us all from that and even pornography. May you erase it and destroy it from our lives and our lives in Jesus uh, and our eyes in Jesus' name. Al-Ruhu. It is a disease and it plagues many of us. May God save us in Jesus' name and help us. Right? Now that said, we're about to begin. We'll begin in prayer. I hope that was from the Spirit. I wasn't speaking presumptuously, but I sense it was. And Holy Spirit, guide me, correct me, perfect me, and save me from error and attributing things to you that are not from you. We need you, Holy Spirit. We are in love with you. And guys, yeah, well, Charles, carry your cross as Jesus to give you the grace to overcome your desires and struggle with your desires, but you cannot have sex before marriage. I'm just telling you, that's biblical. You can't do it. I know it's hard. Sucks, but hey. about that? I see what you're asking. Sorry. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, guys. Uh, here, the connection is great. Sometimes it's going to buff, buffer. Choose Jesus. I'll answer that. If you want, I'll answer that to you because I don't want to get into debate today. I'll do a session on it. But if you want, Zena has my number. Call me. Right? And we'll talk because I don't want to start World War III like yesterday. I don't, want to, I don't want to start World War III. Okay. I just don't want to do it. Honestly. You thought you were dead? Why, Christian? Yeah, because yesterday was World War III, man. I don't want to start it. Anyway, uh, I had to make a point before I begin in Jesus. Okay, here. Let me explain why. Why people who are sexually active before marriage, it will never work out. Okay, guys. We, we, we were in the world. We didn't always walk with Jesus, okay? So we all have sinned, and many of us, before we came to faith, engaged in premarital sex, right? God has forgiven us. The blood of Jesus has washed us, and may the Spirit give us power never to do that again, okay? But for those of you who have done that, listen, hear me out. Anytime a relationship begins with the foundation of sex, it does not last, right? When people go out and start becoming sexually active, what's connecting them is that sexual pleasure. But sexual pleasure can only give you satisfaction for so long. When it fizzles, because there was no foundation, because you didn't develop a friendship and a bond, that does not keep the relationship so it ends up in disaster because once that sexual pleasure dissipates, you realize there's no foundation connecting you. You have nothing in common. You're not even friends. And so the relationship ends in disaster and you move on to the next victim. Now let's look at relationships that start on the foundation of Jesus and a friendship based on that foundation. When you get to know someone, and become best friends with that someone and start worshiping Jesus with that someone. <clears throat> and the foundation is Jesus. Now your relationship is not shallow. It's not blessed based on some physical pleasure that's momentary. Now it's the true <clears throat> relationship that has a solid foundation because now you fall in love with that person. That person falls in love with you. And you two become inseparable because you become best friends. And now the gift of that is sexual intimacy and marriage. You with me there? Now, prove I'm wrong. I want one of you to say, Sam, you're wrong. I know people whose relationship started on the foundation of sex and it's lasted and they're happily married. So, prove me wrong. Look at every relationship that was based on sexual intimacy. It always ends in disaster because the only foundation they had connecting them was that sexual intimacy. Once it dissipates, they realize, I got nothing in common with this person. This person has nothing in common with me. So now here's where the insanity lies. They then go repeat the same pattern, find someone else to have sex with, with the same disastrous result. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. 
right? Now tell me where I'm wrong. I want someone to say you're wrong, Sam. You're wrong. There are people who started a sexual relationship and it was great. It lasted. You can't falsify the word of God. Folks, you have even Christians who love Jesus who are having a hard time staying married. Right? And the relationships that truly last have Jesus as the foundation and the two become best friends. Can anyone say I'm wrong? Please, I want you to and give me an example of that I'm wrong. Somebody. Anybody. Somebody, anybody. Anyone? Christian Karen, don't dwell on your past. If you've repented, you're under the blood of Jesus, you're forgiven. Just now, move forward. Don't look behind you. We've all fallen, uh, fallen and failed Jesus. All of us have done things to shame Jesus. All of us have been intimate before we came to Jesus. The Lord Jesus has washed us, forgiven us, and may the Spirit transform us. Not to repeat it, but look ahead. That was your past. Don't remind yourself of your past. Don't make it your present or your future. Is my sister Anna growing here? Anna growing, is she here? Yeah, that's what I said, Coco Puffs. You have even Christians, Christians who have a hard time staying married. How much more if you're an unbeliever and the foundation of your relationship is sexual? Right, Coco Puffs? So don't make marriage harder than it is by shacking up with someone before marriage, making the foundation sexual. That won't last. If it's hard enough to stay married as believers, then you think. That a relationship whose foundation was sexual is going to last? Okay. Now, Anna Growing, I don't know. You're a precious sister. I love you for the sake of the Lord. I don't know if it's if I'm asking you, am I out of place? Are you, are you married, sister? Just curious. You'll see why I'm asking. Just want to ask because I want to. I was just talking about Proverbs 31 women. Proverbs 31 women that love Jesus. Okay, I just want to see. Okay, guys, Anna Growing is a Proverbs 31 woman. I see her love for Jesus. She sold out. From what I see, she loves Jesus. So now, here's this sister who loves the Lord. She's single. But because women like her are few, and there's so many men out there, you got competition. Here's a Proverbs 31 wife. Lisa, Liza J, Proverbs 31 wife, right? So you got some more Proverbs 31 wives here, not married. Most of the Proverbs 31 wives are married. Pray, guys. You never know. You may get an honor going who'll be sold out for Jesus, right? And if you get someone like that, God is giving you favor. Proverbs 18:22. Anna, because you're choosing Jesus and love, he will reward you. The fact that you got out of an engagement, see that as God saving you. Because, Anna, I see your passion for Jesus and your love for the Lord. You can't be with someone who's mediocre spiritually. You need to be with someone who's sold out for Jesus. On fire for Jesus. And even more spiritually mature than you. Or you're going to be carrying that man. Instead of him leading you. So see it as a blessing. God intervened. So you didn't marry someone who wasn't on fire for Jesus. So you end up with kids and divorced and in misery. Look at me. Because if I had walked more faithfully with Jesus, I wouldn't be in this. So I got what I deserve. Discipline from the Lord. Because he disciplines those whom he loves. But out of that, he gave me two beautiful angels. So my two Valentines heart from Jesus are my angels, and I love them. Thank you, Jesus, for them. I'll never regret it. Okay? So let's take a moment. I'm not celebrating a pagan holiday. Today is Valentine's Day. So if you give me permission, I want to pray for us.
and tell Jesus, Lord Jesus, you are truly our Valentine's Day. You are truly our Valentine's heart. And for us, every day is Valentine's because we have you every day in our hearts. Our hearts are your thrones, Lord Jesus, our everlasting thrones. We ask, Lord Jesus, you forgive us. Forgive me, Lord, for failing you. Please help me crucify my flesh. Lord, not to be a hypocrite. Bless us, Lord Jesus, and fill us with your spirit. Wash us in your holy blood, Lord Jesus, and give us victory to walk in the life of the spirit. And Lord Jesus, bless our loved ones. Bless everyone here who's hurting, who's either gone through a failed marriage or is in a miserable marriage. Bless them, Lord Jesus. Remind them that you love them. Remind them that you have the power to heal them. Their brokenness can be healed by the blood of your cross, by your love that conquered sin, Satan, and death. And fill us with your love, Lord Jesus. And bless the children in these marriages. Keep them whole and safe. Cover them with your blood and fill them with your love and seal them by your spirit, Lord Jesus. In my case, my daughters, Lord Jesus. Love them as only you can love them. And for their sake, save me, their Baba, from these trials. Keep me free to serve you and to be in their life, Lord Jesus. And Lord, bless this session. Fill me with wisdom and knowledge to bless your people who love you. And I love them for your sake, Lord Jesus. Though I fail you and fail them, I'm here by your grace. Because you said, Lord Jesus, if we love you, we will feed the sheep. I'm not qualified, but your Holy Spirit is my guide, my teacher, my God, my love, my Lord, my life, my Savior, my all in all. He is our God, your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of your Father. And in Him we trust to fill us and guide us and teach us. Bless this session, Lord Jesus. Save me from error and stammering. Give us the holiness to delight your heart and forgive us when we fail. And give me the health I need to serve you, Lord Jesus. And show up in a miraculous way today for my daughters and for people who are alone, who have no human valentines to share this with. You are our valentine's heart. And this day we give to you and every day, Lord Jesus, we don't need to ask you to be our Valentines because you are, because you're in love with us and we love you. And Lord Jesus, show up for me in February 19, miraculously, please, Lord, I need you. I can't fight this and show up for me March 10. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you in Jesus name, in Jesus name, in Jesus name. Yeah, Panos, because I'm at child of God's house, pray, pray, God bless this man. He's allowing me to come into his home, use his internet free of charge. No more at my brother's house. I'm done there. Yesterday, I was about to throw myself out the window. Guys, I'm going to take off my jacket because from the heat of the conversation, I'm sweating. And don't hate, I'm wearing the same shirt I wore yesterday, okay? Someone is telling me I was wearing the same shirt two days in a row. Then they're saying, look, look, same shirt. Ha, 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 ha. Ha, 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 ha. Ha, ha, ha. Don't hate, man. Don't hate. I'm losing that weight, baby. In Jesus' name, keep it off. Okay. Now imagine, I haven't been in the gym for over a month. You know why? Because I got hit with the flu, right? I haven't been in the gym for a month. But muscles got memory. That means I got a letter of memory. Once I get settled, I'm going to get my muscles back. I'm going to get my V shape. So instead of being an upside-down V, because right now I got an upside-down V. And I got love handles that nobody loves to handle. Maybe if I got a V taper, then they're going to start loving me, baby. Gilu, baby. What you gonna do, brother? Yeah, brother. <laughs> you gotta admit, man, I do make bald look beautiful. As I'm looking at my face, I make coffee stained teeth look gorgeous, big nostrils look beautiful, and bald heads look sexy. Are you gay? We ready? Now, Jesus is God. Were you trying to ask me questions? Yeah, I got to. In fact, hey. Your wish is my command. Yeah, for you. Uh, Medic, by the way, I hope yesterday you got blessed, right? Did you get blessed yesterday, Medic, when I went in-depth and unpacked Genesis 4-7, all those issues? Is it helping you? Is it sharpening you? Because you are a brother that I love dearly. Though I give you a hard time, it's out of love. I like to hurt the people I love. We have a saying in Assyrian, and the Assyrians are listening. In Assyrian, we say, Chush kisdochet mebchiluch la mechikluch. That is the Iranian version. That's the Jilu version. All right, are you a Syrian? God bless you, sister. 
Oh, you're Syrian too? Okay, you know what that means? Let me give you the translation. Do you want me to give you the New Living Translation version of that saying or the King James Version? It says, go to the one who makes you cry, not to the one who makes you laugh. God bless you, Joe. I got Assyrian brothers, sisters in love with Jesus. Hallelujah. That's an Assyrian saying. Go to the one who makes you cry, not to the one who makes you laugh. Because when someone makes you cry, that makes you now do a lot of self-inspection, a lot of deep thinking, a lot of soul searching. But if I'm always making you laugh, that means you'll never take life seriously. Right? Right? So, guys, every time I yell at you, make you cry because I love you. And when I call people filthy dogs, that's because I love you. Let me let me just say it again. Open rebuke is better than hidden love. Amen. That's in the Proverbs. Let me tell you why. I love dogs. My favorite animals are dogs. Dogs have been loyal to, to me than some, some human friends of mine. Not all human friends, right? I love dogs. So when I call you a filthy dog, it means I love you and I want to wash you. Stop being filthy. Come, let me wash you. And I'll wash you by insulting you, right? Or I'll wash you by just spitting on you if you're close enough. Because, by the way, I am known for, uh, you know, holy saliva. In live audiences, many people tell you, by the time I'm done with a sermon, they are so wet from my saliva, I've showered them for that night. And I say, hey, don't you dare take a shower. Because every part of a Christian is holy, even their saliva. So the more saliva I spit on you, the holier you become. Right? Why you guys hate it, man? Yeah, okay, J Jesus is my God. You know how many times I've answered John 20, 17? I've answered it a million times. I have articles on that, John 20, 17, and sessions on my channel. Do a search and find it, that John 20, verse 17 brother. So instead of asking me, go start listening to all my YouTube sessions and read my articles. It's there. It's there. I've addressed that question. Jesus is God. Okay. Stop hating, man. Don't hate. Participate. And when I call you guys losers, I said it last night. I'm going to say it again. Guys, when I say losers, because you guys always think negative, let me remind you of a passage. Are you guys ready? Titus 1 15. Titus chapter 1 verse 15. Okay. It says, to the pure, all things are pure. To the corrupt and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Their very minds and conscience, consciences are corrupt. So if you're pure, you'll take it as a compliment. You know I am complimenting you when I call you a loser? Did you know that? Uh, Bisquick, you need to go. Send Bisquick to Aunt Jemima. Hey, Bisquick, go visit Aunt Jemima because you need a lot of syrup. Get him out of here. Okay? Do you know why calling you a loser is a blessing? Do you know why it's a blessing? Guys, honestly. Because I'm saying you guys are losers because you lost your weight of sin. The burden of sin, you've lost it. You've gotten rid of it. So you're all world-class losers. Rejoice. Loser. L for love. Loser. Loser. See? Come on now. Now let's begin. Let's begin. Oh, yeah. By the way, Anna, I should have done this a long time ago. You've earned your stripes. Hold on. Hold on. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. You are one of them, and so am I. Let's just praise the Lord. Right hand. Right. All right. Let's begin. In Jesus' name. Lord willing, next week by Monday, I should be in my apartment, okay? Lord willing, I'm going to try to get internet as soon as possible, but pray for miraculous deliverance. February 19 is another big day. Pray God removes that person from me. Sela is singing with you. Good. By the way, Cambello. Cambello is a sister who loves Jesus, right? And wants to give her life for Christ completely. Pray for her, godly man in her life. And she has a beautiful little girl. She's singing with me, Sela? Okay. I got to sing one more song for Sela. February 19. I need a miracle or they can cause me trouble. Here. I, I'm excited today. We're going to do a three-hour session today because I love you guys. I'm excited today, man. I don't know what happened. All right. Now, I love this song and I want to sing it. I'm going to sing it for Sela too. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. 
calling for you and for me. Why do you tarry when Jesus is calling? Come home, come home, sinners, come home. Man, I love that song. I would play it, but they're going to flag me for copyright violation. The Muslims will, so I can't play the song. I love that song. When they used to sing that song, the Baptist churches that I used to go to, I would start bawling. Right? Because listen to the words. Softly and... See, I'm about to cry now even singing it. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling for you and for me. What, see, man, it chokes me up. Why do you tarry when Jesus is calling? Right? Man, bro. Whew. Let's begin. In Jesus' name, may be glorified. Look for that song online, by the way. It's one of my favorite, favorite songs. It's uh, Jesus is Calling, Run to Christ. Do us Google it, not Google it. YouTube, Jesus is Calling song. I promise you, if you listen to the words, you'll start crying. It's so powerful. There is a prayer as part of our liturgy in the Church of the East that's in Assyrian. If you hear that prayer, you will start bawling immediately. Those who, who speak Assyrian know what I'm talking about. It's, it's a prayer to the Lord to bring into his heavenly kingdom the person that's dead, right? If you hear the words, you will start call, crying, okay? I'll just give, I, I'll know the whole words, but when I start hearing it, I start bawling. You Assyrians know what I'm talking about, right? Church of the East, they'll say, Right? And then that says, You know that one? I, there's only two words I know. Once it starts, everyone starts bawling. Yes. Thank you, Rana. Am I exaggerating, Rana? When that song, when they start praying that prayer, everyone starts bawling. I can't sing it anyway. Anyway, let's go. Let's get into the topic. You guys ready? We're going to talk about how to use the Jehovah's Witness Bible to prove the Trinity and the deity of Christ. Okay? Using the Jehovah's Witness Bible to prove the Trinity, deity of Christ, and the eternal beginning. God willing, next week when I settle, guess what series I'm going to start? I'm going to start doing book-by-book -book exposition, if God is pleased to give me the wisdom to do it. We'll go through books of the Bible, break them down chapter by chapter, verse by verse. But I'm going to start with the Gospel of John. So I have two new sessions with all these other sessions that I'm doing. As long as God gives me the health and holiness to do it. Gospel of John, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. It's going to be a very long, slow process for me to go through 21 chapters of John. And Lord willing, I'm going to start next week. The biblical basis for the Nicene Creed. And you want controversy? That's going to be controversial. <laughs> Boy, I'm going to get attacked. Am I going to get attacked when I start that series? Right? Some medic said something that got an amen. I'm, I'm excited. You will do good, Anthony. You will do good. You know your stuff, and just by the grace of God, may he use you. Medic said something? Hold on, man. I'm shocked. He said something that got an amen. All right. Okay. And that's it. Let's begin. Someone asked me about the 144,000. Let me really quickly explain what they believe about the 144,000. Jesus is my God. Are you listening to me? Listen to me, bro. Jesus is my God. Are you listening? I just want to make sure you're listening. Okay. Did you know I just did a three-part series several weeks ago on Jesus submitting to God the Father? On my channel why are you asking me questions that I've answered a million times and you'll find your answers on my channel or on answeringislam.net or on my blog I have articles and sessions addressing all these issues why are you panicking why are you freaking out brother someone told me Jesus is ah! <laughs> okay why don't you take the time go to my channel Put in Jesus submits to God and see what you find and go on the website, answeringislam.net, do a search, Jesus submits to God. You're going to find 
more information than you can handle. More information than you can handle. Right? Are you with me there? We've addressed this. We have thoroughly refuted it. It's done. The information is there. Stop panicking, my brother from a different mother, like no other. I'm telling you, God has raised up warriors who've answered these objections for 2,000 years. I'm not the first to answer these objections. Great men and women of God of the past, the church fathers, were refuting these objections from the time Jesus went into glory. All you need to do is search. It's there. I promise you it's there. And maybe first, last, maybe if you can find the links to those sessions on my YouTube channel, he'll post them then for you. Don't panic. It's okay. You're all right. Jesus is God. No one can dethrone him. Even though Hater Wood is one of the greatest haters mankind has ever known, and Hater Wood hates the fact that I'm blowing up, even though I'm not making this kind of money, and Hater Wood hates the fact that he couldn't do Bible exegesis if his life depended on it. But for the sake of the Lord, I want to still carry Hater Wood till I die. Even though that's a lot of weight to carry and I need a back brace and I'm going to be in a wheelchair, he's worth it because Jesus says he's worth it. I'm not going to abandon this loser. I'll even die for this loser because of Jesus. All right? We're okay now. Woohoo! Hater Wood, send me some of your 600 viewers, Hater. You got the most boring sessions known to man, and you get about 900. Come on now. Darn it. When am I going to exceed your number? Now, let me answer 144,000, what the Jehovah's Witnesses believe. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe the 144,000, unless they've changed their position. Unless they've changed their position. I don't know if they have, because they keep getting further light, further illumination. So they'll tell you, yeah, 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 back then we believed that we were wrong. Now we received... More light from Jehovah. Okay, they they do that. They do believe the 144,000 is a literal number. But here's where it gets really, what's the word I'm looking for? Inconsistent. Where do we get the number 144,000? Let's go to Revelation 7, verses 1-8. Hit the like button, folks. Come on now. Revelation 7, verses 1-8. Thank you, Sal Racinos. Now, if my, you know why it's shiny? Because I am illuminating the light of Christ. Amen? Don't hate. Man. Revelation 7, verses 1 8. Here's where they get the number 144,000. Okay, let's read. Revelation 7, verses 1 8 from the Jehovah's Witness Bible. <clears throat> After this, I saw four angels. I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding tight the four winds of the earth so that no wind could blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. I'm going to come back and revisit that in a moment. I'm going to come back because a lot of people don't know this, what the Bible says about spirit creatures influencing the elements, the natural elements, in influencing the wind, the waves, the sea, right? I'm going to get back to that. But let's read verse 2. And I saw another angel sending from the sunrise, having a seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice, to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. Guys, pay attention to these two, first, two verses. Saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until after we have sealed the slaves of our God in their foreheads. Okay? Pay attention to where they get the 144,000. Okay. <clears throat> Verse 4. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed out of every tribe of the sons of Israel. Out of the tribe of Judah. 12,000 sealed. Out of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Gad, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Asher, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Levi, 12,000. Out of the tribe of... Uh, I, this name I've always had our time pronouncing. Issachar, 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 man. 12,000. Whew, these names. Now, verse 8. Out of the tribe of Zebulon, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 sealed. Okay. The Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you 144,000 is a literal number. But here's their inconsistency. Revelation 7 is 144,000 from the tribes of Israel. They'll tell you 
the tribes are not literally Israelites. They're spiritual Israelites. So notice the inconsistency. They'll say the 144,000 is literal, but the tribes is spiritual Israel, not literal Israel. There's no tribe of Dan, nor is there the tribe. Let me see something. Hold on. Dan is not mentioned. Hold on one second. And Ephraim is not mentioned. Two tribes are not mentioned, Dan or Ephraim. You know why? Because Joseph stands in the place of Ephraim, even though Manasseh is the son of Joseph. And Levi is given in the place of Dan. Right? No, no, I'm sorry. Let me correct myself. No. Yeah, well, yeah, it is. Don't confuse me. I'm already confused trying to deal with this cult. I just confused the heck out of myself. Sorry about that. Lord, protect me from misinformation. But you see the inconsistency here? You see the inconsistency here? They'll tell you the, tell you the 144,000, that's literal. But the tribes of Israel, that's not literally Israelites. They're spiritual Israelites. And then you ask them, on what basis do you take the number to be literally 144,000? But the tribes are not actual, literal, physical Israelites. It's spiritual Israelites, meaning the anointed class of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Do you see the inconsistency? Do you see the inconsistency? Once they admit to you that the tribes of Israel are not literally Israelites, then why should I take the 144,000 to be literal? Literal. The 144,000 can be a symbolic number representing the fact that God will save a complete, perfect remnant of Israelites. Why? Because 144,000 is a multiple of 12. 12 tribes of Israel. So each tribe, 12,000 for 144,000, a multiple of 12 showing that God has a remnant of Israel that he will save. So why should I take the 144,000 literally if you're not going to take the tribes of Israel literally? It can be literal Israelites, but the number is symbolic. You get my point? The number may be symbolic, but they are actual Israelites. Why should I assume that the number is literal? But the fact that they're Israelites, that's spiritual symbolic. You get my point? You see how much trust you have to have in this organization and believe that they're God's mouthpiece on earth to accept their inconsistent or selective interpretation of passages? In other words, I have to believe the society is from God to accept that their interpretation is right. Because after all, if you're going to tell me 144,000 is a literal number, why aren't the tribes literally Israelites? All oh, because the society says they're not. But who gave them authority? Jehovah. You see the problem? You get the point? You have to first be brainwashed into accepting the society as God's mouthpiece to accept their interpretation. Everyone understanding the problem? with their approach to the 144,000. Yeah, do you understand the problem with their approach to the 144,000? So I can move on to meet, weightier, meteor issues. And that's what I asked one of them. I said, hold on, 144,000, that's literal, yes. But it says the tribes of Israel. Oh, that's not literal physical Israelites. It means spiritual Israelites, and that's the anointed class. How do you know that's spiritual? Oh, because the society told me. Oh, I see. Clear, right? So let's go into weightier meteor issues. Lord willing, when I do the biblical basis for the Nicene Creed, guys, this is where I need you to listen. When I do the biblical basis for the Nicene Creed, I will revisit the issue of Christ being eternally begotten. We're going to go in great depth, right? So the things you've already heard about Christ being begotten, not created, I will repeat for the Nicene Creed, Lord willing. Right? Marion, grand, good question. Let me answer that so we can go into this. They'll tell you, Holy Spirit will make it known to you. Do you guys remember in the previous session, I said that when they observe the Lord's Supper, they don't call it the Eucharist. And definitely their Lord's Supper wouldn't be Eucharist. Eucharisteo. Eucharisteo is the Greek word for Thanksgiving. Right? 
an offering of thanks to God for what he's done for us in the person of Jesus Christ on the cross. Anyway, they do the Lord's Supper once a year on the eve of Passover when the Jews settle it. If you ask a Jehovah's Witness, do you observe the Lord's Supper? They'll say once a year, they'll have a meeting, they'll rent out halls on the eve of the Jewish Passover, and they'll gather to commemorate the Lord's Supper. Okay, now, here's where it gets interesting. Here's what gets interesting. If you're not part of the anointed class, then you cannot drink the cup that they pass, and you cannot eat the bread. You can only look at it and pass it on because they'll tell you that the Lord's Supper is only for the anointed class, not for every Jehovah Witness. Now, here's what they told me. Here's what they told me. I heard this from one of their elders. Holy Spirit may be putting in the heart of one of them to take and eat. If anyone in that meeting eats or drinks it, that's a sign to the elders that person may be part of the 144,000. So they start interviewing him afterwards. Hey, why did you take it? Because I sent some part of the 144,000. And then they examine him to see if it turns out he's part of the 144,000. See how that works? Soldier of Christ, in Revelation 7, I take it to mean a symbolic number of physical Israelites that Jesus will save along with the Gentiles. That's my take on it. I can be wrong, but the reason why that's my take, soldier of Christ, because Revelation 7, 1 to 8, mentions the tribes of Israel, but then 9 to 17 mentions the Lamb saving people from all tongues, all nations, all languages, right? All tribes. And they were so numerous, they could not be numbered. So I believe that in Revelation 7, it's talking about the Israelites and the nations all being saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus, by his shed blood. So I take Revelation 7, 1 to 8 to refer to actual physical Israelites, a remnant from the nation of Israel that Jesus will save along with all the nations. That's my take on it. Okay? Now, do you understand how they dis dis discern whether someone is part of the anointed class? They'll say, that the Spirit will make it obvious to the person and confirm it. I don't know, Anna, going, because it's not in the Bible, so this can be a tradition that's right or wrong. You get my point, Anna, going? If it's not explicit in the Bible, I have to defer. Can be, maybe not, because you have to show that in Revelation, I'm sorry, Matthew 2, that they slaughtered 144,000 children. Bethlehem was a small town. It didn't have that many people in it. At the at most, and we have scholars, and I'm, I'm depending like on Ben Witherington, statistically, you would have maybe 20 to 30 children to and under at that time because Bethlehem was a small town, even says a small town that others viewed to be insignificant and didn't have a large population. So if the Orthodox saying it's those children, then obviously the 144,000 has to be symbolic, right? Because the population was too small for it to have that many. And then that assumes that the children that were slaughtered in Bethlehem, they were all from the different tribes. See, there's a lot of assumptions in that belief. Assumptions that can be right can be wrong. That's why I try to stick with the Bible as close as possible. So if there's a tradition that doesn't contradict the Bible, it may be right, it may be wrong. But if it's tradition that contradicts the Bible, then it's definitely wrong. You get my point? Let me repeat that again for the benefit of others. You may have a tradition that doesn't contradict the Bible. That tradition can be right, can be wrong. We don't know. Unless we have conclusive proof that tradition that did come from the apostles that was passed on orally. Apart from such conclusive proof, a tradition that doesn't contradict the Bible, guys, you need to listen to this. Can be right, can be wrong. We don't know. Unless you have conclusive proof it did come from the apostles. Then that's a different story. But we definitely know any tradition that contradicts the Bible cannot be apostolic because the apostles cannot teach one thing orally and something else <clears throat> by written transmission that would contradict. What the apostles taught orally by inspiration will not contradict what they wrote down by inspiration. Right? 
Panos, Filippio, I don't know. Anna Growing is Orthodox. She's just telling me what she as an Orthodox has been taught. I'm, I cannot judge that. I'm not Orthodox. So don't hold me accountable. Right? Okay. I don't know what e Ethan Smith. Ethan Smith, because his mother abandoned him and he was raised among a pack of dogs. You see this filthy low life, what he's talking about. Come on, guys. Get rid of this guy. Return him to his, his blood, the blood of the dogs from which he came. You see this filthy guy, what he just said? I'm glad you guys didn't read it, okay? Uh, Chris Spinelli, where is that block button to block you and get rid of you? Because I'm talking about one topic, and you keep going on the Hadith about Jews and Christians being punished. Did you read the title, Joe's Witnesses, Bible, and the Beginning of the Sun? So let me change the discussion, Chris Spinelli, and talk about the Hadith, because you don't care about this topic. You're, you're more focused on Muslims. Why are you here listening to a topic on how to reach Joe's Witnesses? who need to be saved just as much Muslims if you're focused on Islam. Why are you here? Because you keep harping on, where's that hadith? Stop being lazy. Google it. Okay. Let's focus now. Now you understand what they believe about the 144,000? You, you, you understand what they believe about the 144,000? You guys with me there? So I can now go into the eternal beginning of the sun. Okay. Let's talk about the eternal beginning of the sun. Why do I believe, and I know there are Trinitarians today that reject it, right? right? <clears throat> and don't agree with it anymore. But historically, historically, the belief of the church has been Christ is eternally begotten, begotten, not made, and the Holy Spirit eternally proceeds. And I believe those doctrines. I believe them because I believe there's enough evidence in the Bible to show these are correct doctrines. So the early church fathers saw something in the scriptures by the illumination of the Holy Spirit. They were right. Okay. Let me repeat what eternal begetting does and doesn't mean. Are you guys ready? You ready now for the definition? So we can go into some passages, discuss it. And then I'm going to deal with one of the passages. Joe's witnesses misapply to show that Jesus is a creature. And this passage, ironically, here, you know it's ironic? You guys want you to hear this. You know it's ironic? They quote a passage to show that Jesus was the first creature of God that the early church fathers also quoted in reference to Jesus to prove that Christ is eternally begotten. You guys know that? The Jehovah's Witnesses quote the very passage that the church fathers started quoting in reference to Jesus, which Joe's witnesses think proved that Jesus is a creature, but which the church fathers said, no, it refers to his eternal beginning. Right? Any distractions, get rid of them, folks. We don't need agents of love distracting us. Now, what does eternal begetting mean? Eternal begetting means Christ is not created. Christ is not a creature. Christ is has eternally existed with the Father and the Spirit. He's uncreated in essence. He's an eternal, uncreated person. So then why say begetting? Begetting. They meant by begetting, this is what they meant. Pay, att pay attention. This is what they meant. Jesus' deity, his divine essence, his divine nature, his divine characteristics, that divine nature that Jesus possesses is the nature of the Father that he shares in eternally and he shares in completely and he shares in fully and inseparably. See, the early church fathers understood the Father to be the Father, not only because he's the Father the Son, but he was the Father in that he is the source of the divine essence. In other words, if you read the writings of the fathers, they'll tell you God the Father is the Father because he's the fountainhead, the source of the divine essence. The divine essence originates from him. He's the source of the divine essence. And the Son and the Spirit eternally, inseparably share in that divine essence. But the source of that divine essence is the Father. You with me there? So Coco Puffs must be someone I banned, and he's under a different name. Okay. Now, let me give you some biblical support for that. 
Where does the Bible say the Father is the source of the divine nature that the Son perfectly, eternally, inseparably possesses in union with the Father? Okay. You with me there? Now you ready for the proof from the Bible from the Jehovah's Witness Bible? We're revisiting some passages, and I'll pack it with greater depth in the series on the biblical basis for the nice increase. So are you guys now ready for the proof? Okay. Hebrews 1, verse 3. Hebrews 1, verse 3. Hebrews 1, verse 3. We're going to revisit some of the things I discussed. Just to whet your appetite and remind you, because we're creatures of repetition. We need to hear something over and over again until it becomes second nature. Now here, here it is, right there in front of your eyes. And this was the verse that the fathers used. The church fathers used this verse. Guys, focus. Serene, everyone else, don't get into side debate. Just focus for the glory of Christ so you can learn. I want you to learn this stuff for the glory of Christ. Here it is. He is the reflection of God's glory. Notice. Christ reflects God's glory. So who is the source of the glory? God. Who perfectly reflects it? Jesus. Now watch the second part. The exact representation of his very being. Hupostasios. Whose being is it? Whose substance is it? Whose essence is it? God the Father. Did you catch it? And Jesus is the exact imprint, the exact copy, the exact representation, the exact duplicate of God's being. It's God's being that Jesus fully possesses, eternally possesses, and shares in. It's God's glory that Jesus reflects. Notice God the Father is the source of that glory and that essence. I want to take a moment for you, for you to digest that. Do you see it? Do you see it? Is it sinking in? Now, the Greek word used for reflection, apo, and I'm saying it the Erasmus way, apo gasma, apo gasma. And Chris Spinelli, before I shut down, remind me and I'll send you the links. Just be patient, brother. Apo gasma. Don't take my word for it. Look at any Greek lexicon. He just gave you the Greek. I gave it in translation. Apogasma, and I mentioned this in a previous session. I'm going to repeat it again. This is where you got. This is where you see the insights of the early church fathers because their mother tongue was Greek, and as the Holy Spirit was illuminating them, they were catching these words and making connections. Like wow, okay. Apogasma is the word used to refer to a shiny object radiating. Right, <clears throat> the radiance of a shining object. Okay, see the word sun can confuse you. Sun, S O N, and sun, S U N. So now I'm talking about sun, S U N, the sun in out there in space. Here is the sun. Use about an angel. Okay, the sun has radiance. That radiance is the light that comes to us. Apogasma refers to that radiance of a shining object. Here's a shiny object, the sun, and it radiates to us its light. You with me there? Thank you, Jojo. God bless you. Are you with me there? So this is the analogy of Hebrews 1.3 that the fathers picked up on and saw by the illumination of the Holy Spirit its implication. Okay, so here's the sun, and now it radiates to us its light. Are you with me there? It's light. The light is the radiance of the sun. The light is what the sun radiates to us. Now, here's my question. If the light is the sun's radiance, it means its origin is in the sun. It comes out of the sun. But if it comes out of the sun, then the light has the same properties, same substance that the sun has, right? Because the sun will not radiate something that's alien to its substance. It will not radiate to us something alien to its nature, right? Who's not getting this? Who's not getting this? It's radiating, right? Simple, right? 
You see how simple these truths are? That doesn't mean we'll fully comprehend it because we're still dealing with an eternal reality, right? Okay, so if you're with me, here's my other question. So if the light of the sun originates from the sun, radiates from the sun, has its source in the sun, that means the light has the same substance of the sun. What the sun is, it is, right? Right? Now, how does this apply to Jesus? If Jesus is the radiance of God the Father's glory, that means he comes from the Father, his origin is in the Father, right? And he radiates to us God's glory. That means he cannot be of a different nature than the Father. Do so you see the beautiful language of Hebrews? Did you see the inspiration? You see that this man is inspired by the Spirit because he's affirming two truths. The source of that divine essence is the Father, and because the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's being, he is what the Father is in essence. He's not alien to God's substance. He possesses the same essence that God possesses fully and eternally. So he's not of a different essence from the Father. In other words, Hebrews 1.3 is basically telling you that the Nicene Creed was correct when it said that Jesus is homoousias, of the same substance of the Father. Homoousias. It's made of two words. Homo, where we get like homo sapien, homosexual, meaning the same. Usias. You see, the Nicene fathers were right. Jesus can't be of a different substance from God the Father. He must have the same substance of God the Father because he's the radiance of God's glory and the exact imprint of his being. So Hebrews 1.3 affirms, like Alex said, Father and Son are equal in their essence in their nature, in their substance, because they possess the same substance fully, eternally, inseparably. But that substance is the substance of the Father that Jesus possesses. There is your eternal beginning. Clear? I wanted to sink in before I move on to the next point. Is it clear? Okay, now let's go back to the sun in space. That's UN. Okay. The light that comes from the sun. Who generates that light? Who generates that light? This is not, not just Kafir. Is that the same as Iwanis? Because you're making the same comment or Muslim. Okay. The sun, right? So the sun generates that light. No, no, no. We're talking blue. Pay attention. We're using the sun in space now. S-U-N. The sun. The light that comes from the sun. Who generates that light? Or what generates that light? I'm speaking of the sun as a person. Okay? Yep. Homo usian tu patri. Safe substance of the father. Right? Diu tu panta agenita. Through whom all things were made. That's the... Nicene Creed, Panos. Homo usian, homo usian, tu patri, of the safe substance of the Father. Diu, tapanta agenito, meaning same substance of the Father, through whom all things came into existence. All right, now, you thought I didn't read Greek, huh? Tikanis kesi kela. All right, now, S-U-N, S-U-N. Son. Oh, guys, can I let you in another secret? No, Panos, I, I don't read perfectly. Believe me, there are words I stumble. Did you know who helped me learn the Greek of the New Testament? You know where I learned the Greek of the New Testament? You want to be shocked? You want to be shocked? Can I give you this? God has worked in me where I'm an autodidact. Autodidact means by the grace of God's spirit, I'm self-taught, meaning... By his grace, I have to watch or read and then meditate and digest, and then I absorb the information. I've had no Bible teacher. 
I've never been to college and seminary, and I boast to show you how glorious, amazing, and real the Holy Spirit is. Never been to college, never been to seminary. I didn't even get a high school diploma. So you know this is the Holy Spirit of the living God who is so powerful, so real, that he's able to take stupid people like me and give them wisdom to glorify the name of Jesus. Just trust in him, hope in him, love him, and seek him. Seek the face of the Spirit. Now, with that said, you know how I learned the Greek? This is before internet was popular and the Jehovah's Witnesses had internet. The Jehovah's Witness Greek interlinear Bible. I got an interlinear Greek New Testament from the Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall. I opened up to the cover and I started learning the Greek alphabets. And then I started reading the Greek. And I taught myself by the grace of God to read the Greek using their interlinear. Did you know that? Well, Jojo, it's got to be from your heart. Don't pray the way I pray. Pray from your heart. Honest to the Lord. Don't think I'm boasting in myself. May God crucify my flesh and I decrease. I'm just showing you how amazing the Holy Spirit is. Right? If he wants to raise you up for the glory of Christ, he'll raise you up in such a mighty way that scholars will fall before you because of the Holy Spirit's wisdom in you. Honest to the Lord. I'm not lying. So you can thank the Jehovah Witnesses for their Greek interlinear because that's how I learned the Greek. And I have my copy in my boxes in storage. If I ever get to my boxes, I'll show you the copy. Right? You with me there? So I opened up in the, in the front cover. When you open up, they give you the Greek words and the letters, right? Alpha A. Then I started going and reading it. And then I started reading Greek. Is the Holy Spirit amazing or what? I mean, I'm even shocked, honestly, how real and almighty the Spirit is. And may he keep us in love with Jesus. Lord, please. Right? It's amazing. I'm even, honestly, I'm telling you, as I'm telling you, sir, I'm shocked. You know it's the Holy Spirit that equipped us this way, that designed me this way and designed you this way. That's He's more real than you can imagine. And let me just tell you how I pray. Because someone asked me how I pray. But it's got to be from your heart, Jojo. My prayer, when I ask, I say, Holy Spirit, guide me to all truth. I depend on you. I need you. Because you are God. You are my love. You are my life. You are my Savior. My Redeemer. My Deliverer. My Sustainer. My Provider. <clears throat> you are my Creator and Maker. Because you are the Eternal Spirit of the Father and the Son. And you are the perfect guide, instructor, and teacher of the church. I entrust myself to you. Possess me fully. Sanctify me for Christ. Enable me more like Christ and teach me your word to glorify Jesus. Right? But it's got to be from your heart. It's not a magic formula. It's not. It's talking to the spirit as if he's a real person because he is a real person. So. Just to let you know how I learned the Greek. Now, hopefully, I'll, I'll learn the Hebrew script. I'm going to have to teach myself the Hebrew script. Okay, now, let's take the analogy of the sun again. S-U-N. Okay, folks, S-U-N. This is the sun in space. Okay? Sun in space. Light comes from the sun. That's the radius of the sun. What generates that light that comes from the sun? What generates it? What generates that light? The sun, right? Okay. But here's, when you say self-generated, the light from the sun. What is generating the light of the sun? The sun is, Jojo. And we know God created the sun with that ability. Because the sun couldn't do nothing if God didn't create the sun with those potencies. We know that. It's God, ultimately. Right? That creates the sun. To be able to generate its heat and radiance. That's the work of God. Without the God, there'd be no sun. There would be no us. But I'm just talking about the sun, S-U-N. Okay. The sun was created by God with the ability to generate the light that it sends out to us. Okay. So it's generating the light. But here's another question. Because you're going to see how it ties in with the Trinity. Here's another question. Here's another question. Can the sun... Be an actual sun without light. Can the sun be an actual sun without heat? 
No, it wouldn't be a sun. It'd be a supernova. When the sun burns out, if Jesus tarries and the sun burns out, it's no longer a sun. It's a supernova, right? It burns out. So for the sun to be what it is, it always has to have light and heat. Otherwise, it can't be the sun, right? Same with the Godhead. Though the Father generates the divine essence that his son possesses and the spirit possesses, the Father cannot be who he is without his son and the spirit. So he's always been in union with the son and the spirit. They've always existed in union with him. Never apart from him, and he never apart from them, because he cannot be who he is without the Son and the Spirit. You see the analogy? And that's an analogy taken from this word in Hebrews 1.3. You catch it now? That's why it's called the eternal begetting of the Son. Amen. Holy, holy, holy. It's eternal because the Father has never existed apart from his word, his son, and spirit. Begetting because the father is the one that generates the divine essence that the son and the spirit share in fully, completely, eternally. And the church fathers were right because that's scriptural. Now you have scholars today like William Lane Craig and apologists like Stephen A's of Tribal that say, no, that's outmoded way of thinking. It's not... Biblical, it's not rational. We need to discard it. Says you. You want to discard it? That's between you and the Lord. As for me, hopefully my household, my daughters, we will agree that the church fathers were right. What they saw was from the Spirit. It's biblical. So eternal begetting it is. Eternal procession it is. Right? Clear? You see how beautiful and majestic God is and how deep his word is? It was right there in front of our eyes. Other places in which we see the son is begotten, but he's eternal. Soldier, brother, for the life of me, what has that got to do with my point? How do you know that the light is not simply another way of referring to all the shiny objects that became visible and appeared on the fourth day? Why do you assume that the light, that crea a creation of that light, is referring to a different creative act than the actions of God on the fourth day? Because now you're going to now get me on a rabbit trail to go off topic, right, in order to help you understand Genesis 1. What has that got to do with my point? And even in Genesis, in day four, soldier of Christ, just let's go with it. Let's go with what you just said. The sun is the only light. Or were there stars that also emitted light? So how do you know that in Genesis 1, that light is not simply God's way of talking about those objects that will eventually appear to the people on earth that will emit light, separating light from darkness. So you're asking me to go into an in-depth exegesis of Genesis 1, which I don't have time. So why would you mention it? Help me understand your logic and bring that up. No, honestly, I want to know. Help me understand your logic. Come on, soldier Christ. Don't go silent on me. You distracted me by bringing this up. Answer my question. What has this got to do with the fact that the sun in space cannot be what it is without light? What's the connection? Why would you ask me about what Genesis 1 means and what it refers to when it's irrelevant to my point, brother? It's irrelevant to my point. Because now you want me to go off topic and talk about Genesis 1. Come on, brother. I love you for the sake of the Lord. Respect the other people. Don't bring up tangents and relevant issues because then I distract the people and they get upset with me. You know that? You know how many comments I get? Sam, stay focused, please. You're being distracted. It's distracting me. Well, what do you want me to do? If I start blocking people, Sam, you're rude. You're a jerk. You're not being Christ-like. Come on, man. I can't win either way. You know I can't e win either way? If I block people from distracting, you're a jerk. If I then chase in people for distracting, you're a jerk. If I answer people distracting, see, you went off topic. I don't win. 
I don't win. Sorry, guys. Okay. Sorry, I'm just apologizing. But see, you guys think your questions are related. They're not. Because I have to break down Genesis 1. You get my point, everyone? So hopefully in these sessions, you're going to learn how to ask questions, when to ask questions, and when not to ask questions, and think more deeply if that's relevant to the point. Whether the light is the sun or not, how does that affect the point that the sun in space cannot be the sun without its light? How does it change anything? Help me understand. You get my point? Does that change the fact that once the sun was created, it was created to emit light, and it can't be what it is without the light? How does it change that the fact of my statement? Everyone else getting it? You guys still get it? Whether the light of Genesis 1 is a different light from the sun, how does it change the argument that once the sun is created, it has to emit light to be what it is, otherwise it's not the sun? Because the purpose of the creation of the sun was to give light to people on earth. If it doesn't get light, then it's not serving its purpose, its function. It's not the sun. How does that change anything? Get my point? Curiosity killed the cat. And I think you're going to get killed in a minute. Not physically, so I don't want the police at my door. You know what happened, curiosity did to the cat, right, soldier? What happened to the cat because of its curiosity? What happened to the cat, soldier? Curiosity killed the cat, right? You guys know that? Curiosity killed the cat? Right? But satisfaction brought it back. <laughs> because we believe in the resurrection of the dead. All right. Right? Curiosity killed the cat, but satisfaction brought it back. Because we believe in the resurrection of the dead. All right. Now, let's go back. Other passages pointing to the eternal generation of the sun. Are you ready? Sun. Okay. Other passages that point to the eternal generation of the sun. Are you ready? We're going to use the corrupt Jehovah Witness Bible because I want you to use their Bible, be familiar with their Bible to prove your point. Okay. Are you ready? Any distractions, folks, send people on their way because you got one guy saying, I'm a little Jehovah. And Martin Zweig says he's not ready. So that means he should be somewhere else to get ready. Maybe he needs to put his, his wife's dress on and then he'll be ready and color his uh, toes black. All right. John chapter 1, verse 1. It's right there. It's always been there in front of us. It's always been there in front of us. John chapter 1, verse 1. Send GJ back to his mommy so she can give him some dog food. Guys, come on, admins. Get rid of these demons. They're not here to learn. John 1, 1. Here it is, folks. Guys, listen. Here it is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Ignore the fact they mistranslated the Word was a God. I promise you... I will address this mistranslation. It should not be a God, okay? Here's what I want you to focus on. If Jesus is the word, that means he's the word of someone. Jesus is the word of who? He's the word of who? Whose word is Jesus? Even though word is metaphorical in that it's saying he is God's revelation to us, so that when the Father wants to make himself known, he does it always through Christ, by the Spirit, never apart from Christ. God the Father, right? He's the Word of God, the Father. Okay. Folks, understand right there you have eternal generation. You know why? Because if Jesus is the Word of God, that means God is the source of the Word. Like the words that are coming out of my mouth. They are my words that originate from me. I'm the source of those words, right? So do you see again? The language of source, right? And I don't want to use the word derivation because it may imply that he comes later in time. No. God the Father has never been wordless. He's always existed with his eternal word, that person who reveals him through whom he creates. Always, eternally. God the Father has never been wordless. Right? 
He's never been without his logos, logos, where we get the word logic and reason, right? God the Father has never been wordless. So, though he's never been wordless, God the Father is the source of the word. Note, the Father is never called the word of Jesus. Jesus is called the word of God. The Father is never sent by Jesus into the world. The Father sends Jesus into the world. Why do you think that is? Because this is a window that the Spirit has given us in Scripture to see how the three persons relate to one another. Jesus is the word of the Father. The Father is not the word of Jesus, right? And because he's the word of the Father, the Father is the source of that word. There you have eternal generation. Are you seeing it? What's the source of the word? The Father. Who generates that word? The Father. But has the word always existed? Yes, because the Father has never existed apart from his word. It's always been with him, one with him. Right? You getting it, guys? Is it sinking in? Before I move on? Even when he used the language son, father, son, what is the implication? If he's been the son in eternity, notice he's not the brother of God. He's the son of God. Even that language implies something. Father, son. Father, the source, right? And the son, his nature comes from the father, the source of that nature that he's inseparably one with. So even this language you can't escape unless you simply allegorize it. Right? And don't take it for what it means. I'm not saying word of God is not a metaphor and that Jesus is not literally a word in the sense that he's a letter. Right? And he's not literally the voice of the Father because the Father speaks to the Son. That means the Father has a voice that you can hear audibly if he wants you to hear it. He's the word of God in that he is God's eternal revelation. The one through whom God makes himself known and through whom he creates all things. Right? So you're seeing why the fathers came to the conclusion that the son is eternally begotten, not made, and the father is unbegotten, and the spirit proceeds. Because they're looking at the language of scripture, and they're seeing that this language is pointing to a greater reality a reality that exists among the members of the Godhead eternally. Does it now make you appreciate the insight of these fathers, these great men of the church that the Holy Spirit used to defend the church, the church to explain the faith, to die for the faith and safeguard the faith, love the faith because they love Jesus. Right? Clear? Let me give you other examples. Now, we're using the Jehovah's Witness Bible because some verses you can't use in certain versions. John 17, 11 to 12. John 17, 11 to 12. John 17, 11 to 12. Jay just texted me. Jay, not the ray, but the light. The light from the sun. You can say rays, but it's more correct to say the light. Okay, guys, catch the language here. Joe Witness Bible. Let's see if you catch it. I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you, Holy Father. Watch over them on account of your name, which you have given me. Wait, 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 wait. The Father gave Jesus his own name? Account of the name which you have given me, so that they may be one, just as we are one. When I was with them, I used to watch over them on account of your name, which you have given me. Wait, Jesus. The Father's name is your name and was given to you? When was it given to you? The Bible says you've always possessed it. Because by the name, it means the authority of the Father, the nature of the Father, the characteristics of the Father. Right? Okay? It refers to the Father's authority. His characteristics, his power. 
How do I know that name here means his characteristics? Because it says, I kept them by your name, meaning by your power. By your power, I preserved them from perishing. And that's the power you gave me. But hold on, Jesus. You've always had that name, those characteristics, that power. So when was it given to you? Remember what I said in the previous session. God cannot help but use finite, temporal, limited language, human language that is finite, temporal, and cannot perfectly describe this eternal reality. So that's why when Jesus speaks about Father giving him, don't always assume that he's receiving something in a moment of time. It's simply Jesus' way of communicating the fact that that name that the Father has, that nature that the Father has, is mine because my nature, my power, my name is the very nature, the very power, the very name of the Father, who is the source of all of that which I possess, but I've always possessed it. You with me there? Now I'm going to prove to you that Jesus has always possessed this name, this power, this authority. He had it even before creation. Can I prove that to you? Can I prove that to you? Okay. We're going to use now the interlinear... Interlinear Greek New Testament of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Are you ready? We're going to switch now. Let me give you the link. Oh, by the way, please, guys, remind me to read something from a Jehovah's booklet. Do not let me end this session without reading it, all right? Let's go there. Did you guys know there was this much meat, this much depth, this much beauty in the Holy Bible? And these are insights I didn't come up with. Christians saw these insights by the Holy Spirit from its inception. All these insights were seen by the fathers and commented by the fathers in their writings. It didn't originate with me. Now, did you give me the link? Okay, all right, here it goes. Okay. Here's the link of the Jehovah Witness Bible. Guys, I need you to do me a favor. you got to look at it. Because you're going to see the Greek doesn't have the def the indefinite article A. I promise you, I'll do a session just on John 1.1. 1, 1. Guys, you want me to do the next session? Exegeting John 1.1, 1, 1, by the grace of God. An exegesis of John 1.1 1, 1, to refute the Jehovah's Witnesses and other anti-Trinitarians. You guys interested in that? My next session will be on that. How many want me to do it? Now, I know this guy's <laughs> – look at that, Nick. Sam, please don't block me. Okay, brother, as long as you buy the shirt, I was blocked by Sam Shamoon, and you support my ministry and pray for me for deliverance of my daughters, I won't block you. Okay? Blue Bubble Tron, you just made my day. Let me take a moment to tell you why. My prayer to the Holy Spirit has been this. Please use me. By your power to see Christians fall more in love with the Bible and more in love with the God of the Bible, who is real, more in love with Jesus, who is alive. That's been my prayer. And the fact that you said that, you bless my heart. Because the goal of a teacher who loves the Lord, and I love him imperfectly to my shame, the goal of a teacher is to be used of the Spirit, to see more people fall passion in love with, with Jesus, and want to live for him and even die for him. That's the goal. So to say that to me, you bless me, brother. Okay? You really did. Now, next session will be John on John 1.1. 1, 1. But for the sake of time, here's what I want you to look at. Here you go, John 1.1 1, 1 in the Greek. I'm going to pronounce the Greek the way they do in seminaries in the West, the Rasmin pr pronunciation. So Greek guys, girls don't condemn me. I'm butchering the Greek. Because that's how I actually started pronouncing because I would hear them pronouncing it. Akuriasmu kai ha theasmu. Right? Let's read it. En arche or en arche. En arche en hologos. Ke kai hologos en prostontheon. Ke or kai, because they pronounce it kai, the conjunction. 
the, uh, Theus or Theos and Hologos. Okay. And Arche and Hologos. Que Hologos and Prostontheon. Que uh, Theos and Hologos. Okay, now read their translation. Notice how they translate it. In beginning was the word, and the word was toward the God, and God was the word. Though they put the word God, G, in lowercase, notice there's no indefinite article. There's no A. It's simply, and God was the word. Did you catch it? That's their Greek interlinear. Here's the link. In beginning was the word, and the word was toward God, and God was the word. No A. And I'll explain that later. Folks, is Jesus called uh, Theos, Theos, God in Greek? Is Jesus called God in Greek? Right there, do you see it? Theos, right? Was he with someone called God also? So Jesus, the word, was with God and was God, right? So how many is that? How many you have? Existing together who are called God. How many? Theos. Two, right? Two, right? You see it? Okay. Now, how long has Jesus the Word been Theos? Theos. How long has he been Theos? Uh, theos. Has he always been Theos? Or did he become Theos? Now, let's read. Their English translation. John 1, verses 2 to 4. Let's read their English translation. John 1, verses 2 to 4. Watch this. Theon, again, because you're not a native Greek speaker, it's the same word, Trip. Theon is the accusative case. Theon is simply theos in the accusative case. It's God, buddy. Trip. Don't trip and don't fall. It's the same word. Any Greek reader tell you the reason why the ending of certain words change, like theon with the new or theos, right? The stigma is because of the position it has in the sentence. Okay? The reason why it says Jesus is with theon, because theon is the object. So when it's the object, it will have the new, the N at the end of the word. Theon, not theos. Theos, the S, is, is the form that the word takes when it's the subject. Thank you, Anna. See? In Greek, it would be anas, so that we can then change it to anan or anau, right? Or anao. Like panos. Panos, if he's the object, would be panon. If it's genitive, so in possession, it'd be panu. If he's the dative, it'd be pano with another O. Well, without the o, without the S. Panos, panu, pano, panon, right? Tikanis, kesi, kela, yelere. Okay, clear? I don't want to confuse the rest of you. Nadas, nadan, nadao, nado. Right. Okay, now, with that said, let's come back. Lastos, firstos, lastos, firsto. Anyway, I'm getting, I'm getting silly now. All right. Here's my question again. According to their own Greek, Jesus is the, uh, theos, theos. Jesus is theos, and he's with someone who is also theos. So my question is, how long has Jesus been theos? According to John 1. That's the question I want to answer. This is where I need you guys to pay attention. John 1 verses 2 to 3. John 1 verses 2 to 3. Come on, guys. Let's get that like up to 115. We got about 115. John 1, 2 to 3. Let's read the Jehovah Witness translation. John 1, 2 to 3. This one was in the beginning with God. Now 3. All things came into existence through him. Apart from him, not even one thing came into existence. And what has come into existence, we're going to now read four. By means of him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now notice what it says. This logos, who is uh, theos, this word who is God, was there 
in the beginning, and God used this word to bring all creation into existence. This word was used by God to create all things, to bring all things into creation and give all things life. Okay. Now, when it says all things, how do we know John is saying all of creation, that the word was used to create all creation, the heavens and the earth and everything in them, the entire creation. How do we know that? Because of the way he begins the verse. How did he begin the verse? John 1.1. 1, 1. A lot of meat today, guys. A lot of meat. How did he begin the verse? John 1.1. 1, 1. Okay. Let's see how he began it. In the beginning. See, guys, God willing, maybe tomorrow, I should be able to do a session tomorrow. I'm going to do an exegesis of John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. Lord willing, tomorrow, if God is pleased, I'm going to show you that John is an inspired commentary on Genesis chapter 1. John is now interpreting Genesis 1 by revelation Holy Spirit, bringing out the meat of Genesis 1 and showing you Jesus' role in Genesis 1. John 1.1, 1, 1, the Greek of John 1.1, 1, 1, starts in the same way of the Greek of Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. En arche. Yeah, I'm not going to use the Jehovah's Witness Bible tomorrow. En arche or en arche. Did you know that's how the Greek translation of Genesis 1.1 1, 1 starts? Let me give it to you. Praise God for modern technology. All of this is free. So you don't have to buy the books or the commentaries. It's online free. You just need internet. So all that money you save from books, send it to my ministry. Make me rich so I don't have to worry about money. Haters. Here you go. The English translation of the Greek version. The English translation of the Greek version. First and last, posted it. Click there, folks. Please click there. Go to Genesis 1.1. It says, in the beginning... And to your right, you're going to see the Greek words, en arche, the same two words of John 1.1, 1, 1. en arche. Am I making the connection? Exactly, Alex Gaskin. Everyone making the connection? John 1.1 1, 1 is speaking of the Genesis account of creation. John 1.1 1, 1 is speaking of the Genesis account of creation. Yes, guys, those are my Patreon pages. If you want to support me, please do so. Lord bless you. You'll help me to stay in ministry. Okay, you got it? Who didn't get it? I got to make sure you're getting it before I move to the next point. So what John is telling you is, I'm now going to show you where Jesus is in Genesis. Where is Jesus in Genesis 1? Okay, this is what he's trying to show you, right? With me there? Come on, guys. I'm excited for you guys. We're going to go out with a bang. I just got to make sure enough of you are telling me you're getting it. If someone's confused, let me know. Soldier of Christ, someone, let me know. Say amen. I'm not getting it. Medic, let me know. And so that means if you're silent, that means you're getting it. Okay. Now, how do I know that Genesis 1 is talking about the creation of every created thing? It's speaking of God creating all creation, not just the physical universe. Go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 4 in the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4 in the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Watch here. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4 in the Jehovah's Witness Bible. This is the history of the heavens and the earth in the time they were created in the day that Jehovah God made earth and heaven. Now, it's interesting. Their translation is more of a paraphrase. Now, give me the King James. Genesis 2, verse 4, King James. Watch here. These are the generations on the earth when they were created in the day that Job of God made the earth and the heavens. Now, earth and the heavens, right? Earth and the heavens. Now, give me Genesis 2, verse 1. Job Witness Bible and King James, side by side. I want to see what's happening here. Did you quote you quote the entirety of the passage, right? Okay. Old school. Genesis 2 1, King James, and Job Witness Bible. 
Thus the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. Okay. Thus the heavens and the earth and everything in them was, was com uh, completed. Samuel, what's more hilarious is that you're a filthy barking dog that I'm going to embarrass right here in front of everyone. Do you want me to prove to you that Jesus having life in himself doesn't mean he didn't exist prior to that? Can I now use you as an escape goat to show why you sons of the devil are dumb, deaf and blind, and need to be exposed in shame for being blasphemers, you wicked dogs? Samuel, can I use you to show you you're stupid, you don't know the Bible? No, 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 because he's going to prove my case, guy. This dog is going to prove my case. He doesn't know the Bible because I'm now going to embarrass him with John 5, 26. It's a teaching moment because I'm showing you battle-tested arguments that can't be refuted. But he's too much of a coward and a dog to take me up on the, on the challenge. Okay? Samuel, you just said Jesus having life in himself. I explained it away. I'm now going to humiliate you and show you that Jesus having life in himself doesn't prove he didn't exist prior to that. Are you ready, moron? I have no respect for dogs like you that try to rob Jesus of his glory. Tell me you're ready so I can make an example out of you. We'll come back, guy. Don't worry about it. Be patient, brother. Some of these dogs are useful to prove the point. But he's too much of a dog and a coward. He won't take me up. Okay. Let's see if you're going to rebut this as I shame you and get your mother arrested for giving birth to an animal like you. John 6, 53. Watch, guys, how this is not going to humiliate this clown, this dog. John 6, 53. We're going to use the Joe Witness Bible. We'll see, Samuel. Keep barking like a rabid dog. We're going to see who's going to muzzle who. John 6, 53. Watch here, guys. Joe Witness Bible. Watch here what I'm going to do to this guy. These dogs that don't have the guts to debate in a live exchange. Samuel, answer my question. Jesus said to them, most truly I said, unless you have, eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. Okay, Samuel. Instead of barking and foaming at the mouth, listen. Jesus is saying to the people who are alive and conscious, they have to eat the flesh of the Son of Man, drink his blood. Otherwise, they won't have life in themselves. Now, Samuel, moron, were these people alive and conscious when Jesus said these words? In other words, were they alive? Did they have existence even before Christ gave them life in themselves? Moron. Because his mother needs to be thrown in jail for giving birth to a beast like this, Elderberry. She should be ashamed to have such a child out in public. Samuel, moron. No, you stupid dummy. You didn't hear my question. Even without spiritual life, were they still alive and conscious or they didn't exist? See, I told you I'm going to embarrass you, moron. I know it's spiritual life, but were they still alive and conscious and existing before they had life in themselves? Don't delete it yet. I want him to answer that. Hold on. I just embarrassed this clown. He can't answer. Yes, it is relevant, you idiot, because it shows even before you have life in yourself, you're still alive and conscious, you idiot. You guys see how you got busted? Jesus is talking to people who are alive and conscious, who have existence, who didn't have life in themselves. So even if you want to argue that Jesus was given life in himself, that doesn't mean he didn't exist before that, you moron. You son of Satan. You just got muzzled. Now send this dog on his way. Get out of here. Send him out of here. You see, guy, why you needed to see this? You see how he got caught? Let me show you John 6, 53 one more time. This is for your benefit, because when I have a blasphemous dog who's going to insult Jesus, I'm not interested in witnessing to that person. He's a dog. The spirit deal with him. I'm doing it for you guys. I'm doing it for your benefit so you can learn. I'm teaching you not to be deceived by these sons of the devil. Okay? Let's read it again, John 6, 53. So Jesus said to him, most surely I say to you, unless you, have, you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. It's the same language, life in themselves. Now, guys, these people did not have life in themselves. They would be given it later if they believed in Jesus. But here's my question. Those people didn't have life in themselves. Were they still alive? Were they still conscious? Did they still have existence? So that means even 
If you don't have life in yourself, that doesn't mean you're not alive. So even if you want to say, John 5, 26, the Father gave Jesus life in himself later, that doesn't mean he wasn't alive before that. You got busted, you idiot. You caught it now? This is why I'm telling you, folks, learn these arguments, and I promise you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you won't be refuted. They're irrefutable because they are truth coming from the God of truth, from his word that can't be refuted. So why do I treat this dog harshly? Because he came here not wanting to hear. He thought he's going to attack, and he's mocking Jesus. So he got busted for the filthy dog, son of Satan he is. I'm not interested in these people because they've shown they don't want to listen. But I'm interested in you guys. I want to serve you guys and help you guys to refute these liars, these agents of the devil who want to rob Jesus of his glory. Now, how many of you were blown away by that refutation? You see, even if you want to prove John 5, 26 shows that the Father gave Jesus life in himself, that still doesn't mean he didn't exist before that. You got busted, you idiot. Let me give you the other passage you're going to use against you. John 6, 57, go back, and I promise you I'll, I'll mention the meaning of the explanation of this passage tomorrow, Lord willing. Here's the other one. Okay. John 6, 57. Here's the other one. Just as the living Father sent me, then I live because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will live because of me. So they'll say, see, Jesus lives because of the Father. He couldn't live without the Father, okay, to prove that the Father created him. Now, you know how you destroy that argument? Amen. Nobody will rob Jesus of his glory on my watch. As long as Jesus gives me health, life, and breath, and makes me bold as a lion, you will not get away with mocking my Jesus. You may even have to end up killing me because I'm not going to let you get away with it. I won't kill you because I'm not allowed. Be thankful that Jesus doesn't allow David Wood and others like me to do jihad. Be thankful. Thank you, Jesus. You didn't give us that right because the Muslims would be running for cover. Okay. We slay you with the sword of the spirit. We slay you by spiritual weapons. Right? Anyway, John 6, 57. Let me explain this to you guys. Let me explain it to you guys one more time. They'll say, see, Jesus lives because of the Father. That means the Father gave him life. In other words, Jesus didn't exist. Okay, guys, this shows you how stupid they are. Let's read the second part. So also the one who feeds on me will live because of me. Question, you anti-Trinitarian dog. Those who are not feeding on Jesus but feed on him later, will be given life. So are you telling me that before they fed on Jesus, they weren't alive, they didn't exist, they were not conscious, you moron? Thank you, Anna Growing. Exactly. Did you catch the second part? He's talking of people who are alive, who are conscious, who have existence, that you need to feed on me to be given spiritual life. But wait, Jesus, before they fed on you, were they still alive? Were they still conscious? Did they still have existence? Yes. So then why would I assume that because you live, you live because of the Father, that means you didn't always exist? He lives because of the Father, but because the Father always lives, the Son always lives. Because the life of the Son is the life of the Father. No Father, no Son, no Spirit. Of course he lives because of the Father, because he's inseparable from him. But the question is, has the Father always lived? Yes. And the Son has always lived in union with him. Jesse, if I'm deceptive, you can refute me, but you can't because you're a filthy dog. It's the same dog, agent of Satan, spiritual whore that you are that's getting refuted. Send Jesse on her merry way, you filthy dog. You're not going to rob Jesus of his glory. And by the way, this too is eternal generation, John 6, 57. Read it, folks, John 6, 57. One more time, we're going to go back to the point. Long session, but it's worth it. Read it one more time. Here's eternal generation, John 6, 57. One more time, Jehovah Witness Bible. 
Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father. Notice, my life is the Father's life. My life is from the Father because the life he shares, he has, is mine. I share it in union with him. That's the generation again. So now the question is, Lord Jesus, how long have you lived because of the Father? He goes, I've always lived. <clears throat> I've always been there. I was there before creation in union with the Father. Because my life is his life. His life is mine, which I share in union with him. So there's the eternal generation again. And that goes back to Genesis 1 again. How do I know that Jesus the Word has always existed eternally? So he's always lived because of the Father? Because he's always lived in union with the Father? And the Father's life has always been his life eternally? Let's go back to Genesis 2.1 in the Joe Witness Bible. And in the King James. That one they'll say no. It shows that he existed in glory before the creation of the world. Not eternally Protestant. That's why I don't use these passages. Because I know how they're going to respond. I'm giving you passages they can't refute. By the grace of the triune God. Okay. Genesis 2.1 in the Job Witness Bible in the King James. Thus the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. Heavens and earth and everything in them were completed. Now notice the King James. And the Job in his Bible has a note, has a note saying everything in them means all their host. Folks, I want you to focus on the word host. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. All of the heavens, the physical space, the sky, the spiritual heaven, and all their hosts, everything that dwells in them, and all the earth and everything on it were created. So Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, Mike Rossi, I will smash your face in bullcrap. You don't like it? Get lost, you agent of the devil, you wicked dog. You don't like it? I'll insult you worse. All right. Now, do you see that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are talking about the creation of all creation, all of the heavens, all their hosts in them, and the entire earth and everything in it? It's referring to all creation, the entire creation. All the heavens, the spiritual heaven where angels dwell, the physical heavens, space, sky, and the earth. Is it clear? It's talking about the entire creation, right? And when it says all their host, the host of heaven and earth, Nehemiah 9, verse 6. Nehemiah 9, verse 6. We're almost done, folks. Long session, but worth it. And guys, I'm done about those listening. You don't like me. Shaming, ridiculing, filthy dogs who blaspheme Jesus. Don't come to my channel. Stay away. I don't want you here. Now, my 9, verse 6. Now, my 9, verse 6. Watch here. You alone are Jehovah. You made the heavens. Yes, the heaven of the heavens. See, all the heavens. You made them all. The spiritual dimension called heaven where angels dwell. The heaven of heavens and all their army, all that dwell in these heavens, angels and stars, you made them all. So notice the word army, the word host, means everything that dwells in the heavens, even the angels, the host of that heaven. And all their army, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them alive, and the army of the heavens are bowing down to you. Now, 1 Kings twenty two nineteen, 19. When it says he made the heavens and all their hosts, does that mean angels? He made the heavens and their army. Does that mean angels? And does that mean this heaven where angels dwell? 1 Kings 22, 19. 1 Kings 22, 19. Micaiah then said, therefore, hear the word of Jehovah. I saw Jehovah sitting on his throne and all the army of the heavens standing by him to his right and his left. Guys, you need more proof than one says all their army. All their hosts, it means the angels. So when Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 say, God created the heavens and the earth and all their army, all their hosts, that's the way Genesis is describing all creation. God made all creation, all the heavens, everything in them, the entire earth, everything in it, the entire creation is being covered in Genesis 1 and 2. So it's not just not about the physical universe, right? It's not about even this heaven, the spiritual dimension where angels dwell, Genesis 1 and 2 is talking about all of it, right? The whole creation, spiritual, physical, angels, stars, moon, sun, everything, right? 
Everyone getting it? Genesis 1 and 2 is talking about the whole entire creation of every created thing. Are you getting it? Yeah, his being is not created. Why do I keep saying it? Well, let's go to John 1, 1 to 4. John 1, 1 to 4 in the Jehovah Witness Bible. Because here's my question for all of you, and we're going to wrap it up soon. Here's my question for all of you, wicked dogs. They think I'm going to be nice to them and turn the other cheek. You wicked dogs. You insult Jesus and watch what I'll do to you. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was a God. Forget it. Now, what beginning? Forget that lowercase g. Tomorrow I'll explain it. It's not about Genesis 1. When Genesis 1 says in the beginning, that's the beginning. That's the beginning. Now, notice Jesus' role in the Genesis account of creation, 2 to 4. 2 to 4. I don't know who's calling me. Frank Donner, don't put words to my mouth and don't twist my words. I didn't say that. I'm going to block you and get you out of here. Okay. John 1, 2 to 4. This one was in the beginning with God. This one was in the beginning with God. Which beginning? Before the creation of Genesis. Before the creation account mentioned in Genesis, he was already there. He was already there with God before the creation mentioned in Genesis. And not only was he there, it was him that God used to create the creation mentioned in Genesis. Now you see what John 1 is telling you? It was the Word who became flesh, Jesus, in his pre-human existence, that created the heavens and the earth and all their army, all their hosts, mentioned in Genesis 1 and 2. So here John is telling you, that's where you'll find Jesus. He is the Word that God used to create the heavens and the earth and all their army, all their hosts of Genesis 1 and 2. He created it all. Okay, now let me ask you questions. If John has just told you Jesus is that word that created the Genesis account of creation, the heavens and earth and all their army that Genesis 1 and 2 mentioned, and he says Christ was the one God used to create all of that, and that's all creation. So is John trying to tell me that this word was already there before all creation was existing in eternity so that he's eternal with God? Is that what he just told us? So, John, you're saying this word is not created because he was there already existing with God the Father before all creation? Yes. So what do you have before all creation, John? Eternity. But only God is eternal. Yes. Because the word was with God. The word was God. And if he's God... Then he's just as old as the Father, which is why he's there before creation, which is why he's not part of creation. He's eternal by nature. So, but wait, notice he existed before creation in eternity as God, because it says in the beginning, this word was with God and he was God in the beginning. So wait, John, how long has Jesus, the word been Theos? He was Theos in eternity. You're saying he was Theos always? Yes. He never became Theos? No. He is eternally Theos like the Father is. But I thought God gave him the name. No, he didn't give it to him in time. He's always had the name God because he's always existed with the Father. He's always existed as God, one with the Father. So then why are you saying it was given to him? Given not in the sense in a moment of time. Given meaning he is God because he eternally possesses the very nature of the Father. And if the Father is God and he possesses that nature, he is one with the Father in nature. He's just as much God as the Father is, and the Father is the source of that nature. Welcome to the wonderful world of eternal generation. So when did the Father give him the name? He never gave it to him. He's always had it. But he said, the name you gave me. Yeah, he's not saying gave me in a moment of time. Meaning the name that is yours, which I possess, because I eternally share in your nature, and I'm inseparable from you. So what you are, I am. And what your name is, is my name. Did it make sense? 
Now let's go out with a bang. Let me blow your mind away. We're going to use the King James here and God willing tomorrow. You guys sure you want me to come on tomorrow and do a session on John chapter 1 verses 1 of, 4, 1 of 5? John 1 verses 1 of 5? Okay. Let's go out with a bang. God bless you, Chris. Let's go to Genesis 5 verses 1 to 2. And I'm going to show you a helpful analogy to John 1. A helpful analogy, John 1. It's not identical to God because human creatures are limited, finite, and the analogy breaks down. Humans are not identical to God, but in creation of man, you can get an idea of God's reality even though it's not identical. Because now watch this. Guys, notice this. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God, made he him. Male and female, he created them. Male and female, two persons, he created them. Two beings, human beings. Blessed them and called their name Adam. Wow. Folks, Eve's name was Adam. The male and the female were called Adam. Female's name was Adam. The male's name was Adam. Now, guess what, folks? This means I'm going to use now Adam and Eve as an illustration of John 1. At the start of creation, there was Eve. And Eve was with Adam, and Eve was Adam. Bam! An analogy to John 1. In the beginning, before creation, was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. At the beginning of creation, there was Eve. Eve was with Adam, and Eve was Adam. Wow. So the male was Adam, and the female was Adam. Eve was just as much Adam as the male was. So her husband's name was Adam, but she too was Adam. So Eve was Adam with Adam. Like Jesus was God with God. And Eve came out of Adam, so she was part of him. Just like Jesus is eternally one with God and a part of him and inseparably so. Clear? In the beginning, before creation, was the Word. And this Word was with God in eternity. And this Word was God in eternity. Similarly, at the beginning when God created, there was Eve. And Eve was with Adam, and Eve was Adam. So if you can have creatures that are distinct from one another, but possess the same name because they possess the same nature, then why would you limit God's name to one person? Why can't the name God apply to more than one person when the Bible says there are three persons who are eternally God, eternally existing with one another? Folks, I gave you so much meat tonight. That you got to re-listen and re-re-listen to this, absorb it by the power of the Holy Spirit, and use this information because I'm giving you biblical truths that are irrefutable, cannot be refuted, and will silence any false teacher, blasphemer, dog of Satan who wants to rob the true God of his glory. Okay? With that said, the session is over. Jesus Christ willing, tomorrow I'll do... A session on John 1, verses 1 to 5. Pray for me. Pray for miraculous divine protection. Pray for miraculous favor, February 19, to silence that witch, that demon there in Illinois. Keep her away from me to preserve the money's given me. They don't take it away from me to use it to get on my feet, to bless my daughters. Pray Jesus brings my daughters to me sooner than later. Pray in Jesus' name he removes any man from their lives, starting with Martin Simon Yako. Martin Simon Yako has to be gone from their lives so that Jesus protect them. And convict their mother, Michelle, to repent. Pray for my holiness to be pure and holy, not to succumb to the flesh, to walk in the victory given by the Spirit for the glory of Jesus. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Forgive me for my sins and failures. Save us, Lord. Save us, Lord. Bring more people with a heart to want to learn for your glory. Show us your beauty, your majesty, so that we're always blown away. Because you are real. You are God. And this is your word. And Jesus is alive. Thank you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, which is simply the Greek way of saying, Lord have mercy, Father have mercy, Lord have mercy, Son have mercy, Lord have mercy, Holy Spirit have mercy, we need it.
Please, we need it. And my daughters need it. We love you. Father, Son, Spirit, in Jesus' name. Take care, folks. I'll see you tomorrow, Lord willing. I'll try to see you around 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 2 p.m. Canadian Time. And we'll do a session on John 1, 1 to 5. I wanted to read something from the Jehovah's Witness literature. I'll just save it for tomorrow. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Love you.